afternoon, class, and welcome to today's session, which is called Filing Status and Dependence. And this is a subject that most tax preparers think is boring, uninteresting, irrelevant. After all, it's such beginner stuff. I've been doing tax returns for, you know, two decades. Why should I be wasting my time on these topics? Just to test where you're at and how clever you really are <laughs> on your knowledge base, I've thrown up three different questions here. And we're going to be covering the topics covered by these questions in today's class. So maybe you consider it a little bit unfair to be asking the questions at the start rather than after I've taught the topic. But as we head into the class, I wanted to have your brain working a little bit. And if you would just take a moment to read each of these questions and select the answer that you feel is appropriate, I will then let you know what the real answer is and why. So let's take a look first at the filing status question. And this is really a head of household question. John is married, but has not lived with his wife since May 1st of the tax year. His mother lived with him all year, and he paid all of the costs of keeping up the home. He can claim an exemption for his mother, and the taxpayer may file as head of household. True or false? This particular question is one of the most frequently missed questions on the Oregon Tax Consultant exam. If you're not from Oregon, you might wonder what that is, but it's actually a pretty relevant exam. In order to take the Oregon Consultant exam, you must either be an enrolled agent or you must be a person who has practiced in Oregon as a tax preparer for a minimum of two years and 1,100 hours of work experience as a tax preparer. And to become a tax preparer in the first place, you have to go through a minimum 80 hours of schooling. You have to pass a state exam for tax preparers. So by the time you get to the consultant exam, <laughs> with all of those years of experience and having studied and taken a test, you would think that the majority of preparers could get this question right when they sit that consultant exam. And in fact, it stands out as one of the questions that is most frequently missed. I'll tell you right now that the correct answer is false. We're going to get into the class a little bit later, into the category of head of household. And when we get there, you will see that the reason John does not qualify as head of household is that although he has a dependent, he does not have a qualifying child. And therefore, because he's married, he does not meet the tests for being considered unmarried. And he would be forced to file either as married filing joint or married filing separate and would not qualify for head of household. So let's move on now to the next question in line. And really, these are related. It's two different scenarios with Natasha and her husband. Natasha separated from her husband on November 1st. Her 12-year-old son continued to live with his father so that he could finish out the school year at his regular school. Natasha's income for the year is $60,000, whereas her spouse's income is only $20,000. Under the tiebreaker rules, which parent can claim that child's dependency exemption for the child on their married filing separate return? Well, the tiebreaker rules are basically getting down to a situation where two parents cannot agree on who will claim that child. And if the parents can't agree on who will claim that child, then the tiebreaker rules establish which parent is entitled to that child's exemption. Under the tiebreaker rules, Natasha loses because residency trumps income. Even though Natasha had the higher income, the child lived with the father the greater amount of the year, and therefore the father is entitled to the exemption. Now, in the second illustration, we're assuming that the income is the same and that Natasha is earning sixty, and the husband is earning 20000 But in this situation, they live together the entire year. So the child is physically residing with each parent equally, and when the residency of the child with both parents is equal, then the income wins. So in the second situation, Natasha wins, and she would be entitled to claim her child's exemption. We're going to move on now to an in-depth discussion of filing status and dependence. And when it comes to filing status, Really, the status that confuses people the most is this head of household status. And IRS treats head of household as a high-risk area. In other words, when they do audits, they're focusing in on head of household as possibly a reason why they've even triggered an audit. And they'll be getting right into the issue of head of household eligibility right early on in the interview with a client trying to establish or with a taxpayer trying to establish whether or not that taxpayer qualifies as head of household. Many, many people think they're head of household when they don't meet the definition of head of household. For example, my husband was in the military, and the military usually considers the service member 
to be head of household in a family situation and refers to them as that. But it doesn't mean that that translates over to the filing status. The filing status has entirely separate rules and normal conceptions of who is the head of household has nothing to bear with that. For example, a married couple living together, there is no head of household. There might be a person who considers himself the head of the household, has enough income to be treated as head of household under certain tests, but overall could not qualify for head of household because they don't meet all of the tests. So let's take a look at filing status. In the morning's class, we talked about filing requirements, and filing requirements were based on three things, your income, your age, and your filing status. Well, to determine what your filing status is, you really first have to determine what your marital status is, and then based on your marital status, apply certain tests to determine what filing status you can file under. So you can't use, for example, the filing requirements for a single person if you're married because they don't apply to you. So let's take a look at the marital status first. In general, the first rule to look at for marital status is that your filing status for the entire year is based upon your marital status on the last day of the year. If you're married on the last day of the year, you're considered married for the entire year. If you're single on the last day of the year, you're considered single for the entire year. And it doesn't matter if you divorced on December 30th or got married on December 30th. If you're married on the last day of the year, you're treated as having been married for the entire year. And if you're single for the last day of the year, you're considered single for the entire year. Now, with respect to marital status, the IRS now recognizes same-sex marriage, and they have done so since 2013 when the Supreme Court invalidated a key provision in the 1996 Defense of Marriage Act. That act attempted to put restrictions on the definition of marriage, and the Supreme Court deemed that that definition was unconstitutional, and therefore same-sex couples can marry. And if they do marry, then the IRS must recognize that marriage. However, IRS recognition of same-sex marriage does not apply to registered domestic partnerships. There are a number of U.S. states that have domestic partnerships. Oregon is one, California is one as well, and there's a number of others. And registered domestic partnership allows individuals to receive at the state level benefits that typically are awarded to married couples, including filing joint tax returns. But if you are a registered domestic partner and not also a same-sex married couple, then the IRS will not recognize that registered marriage. So, for example, let's look at some different combinations that we could have. We have an individual who entered into a same-sex registered domestic partnership with a partner here in Oregon, and they did not subsequently marry. On their Oregon tax return, they will file as RDP or married filing joint or RDP separate or married filing separate. That would be the case on the Oregon return. But the IRS wouldn't recognize that registered domestic partnership and would require them to file as single unless they qualify for head of household at the federal level. Now, if things were reversed and they got married in Oregon, then the IRS would recognize that marriage and Oregon would also recognize that marriage. So the filing status on the state return and the federal return would be the same. So in summary, the IRS recognizes marriage wherever that marriage was complete, as long as the marriage is recognized as legal in the jurisdiction in which it was formed. So if you married in California and then you moved to a state that does not recognize same-sex marriage, it could be that the state will not recognize the marriage, but the IRS still will. So IRS does not look to the law of the state where you're living. It looks to the law of the state where you were married. And if in the state where you were married, that marriage is considered legal, then the IRS will recognize it regardless of where you move after that. And that particular recognition extends to foreign countries. So if you marry in a foreign country that recognizes same-sex marriage and then you come to the United States, the United States will also recognize that. So if you are married, whether you are same-sex or whether you are not the same sex, you must file as married when you file your tax return. And let's move on to some filing status facts. So your filing status affects your tax return in the following three ways. Firstly, as I've said repeatedly, your filing status on the last day of the year, generally December 31, is going to determine your filing status for the entire year. And state law determines whether you are considered to be married or unmarried. And your filing status will determine your filing requirement, your standard deduction, your allowable credits and deductions, and finally, how you calculate your correct tax. So filing status is very, very important. That's why you need to get it correct. 
And yet a lot of people don't manage to select the correct filing status or maybe even the best filing status that they're legally entitled to. Now there are five filing statuses. The five possible choices are single, married filing joint, married filing separately, head of household, qualifying widow with dependent child. Now, it isn't uncommon for me to get a phone call from a person who is a new client or even an old client. And the first things out of their mouth are, this year we got married and we need to know whether we should file married or single. Well, their options aren't married or single. Their options are married filing joint or married filing separate. Single is not on the plate. So that's a common language thing I have clients using and undoubtedly there's tax preparers in this country that don't know any better either. Now, some taxpayers will qualify for only one filing status, but others can qualify for more than one status, and it is totally permissible that if you qualify for more than one status, you should choose the status that benefits you most. And that is usually the status that produces the lowest level of tax. Now, there are certain situations where you might choose a tax filing status that gives you a higher rate of tax. And we'll get into some discussions of why someone might choose a higher rate of tax shortly. Single is the first filing status that we're going to look at. And to file as single, you must be unmarried, divorced, or legally separated from your spouse under a decree of separate maintenance. If your spouse died during the year, you are considered married for the entire year and you are not single. So unlike the issue of marriage and divorce, where your marital status on the last day of the year determines your filing status for the entire year, Death does not change that. So if you were married on the date of death, you're considered to have been married for the entire year. So for example, we've got Joe and Betty. Joe dies. And at the end of the year, it's time for Betty to file a return. And she needs to know whether she should file married filing joint, married filing separate, or single. Well, single's not an option because she was married when he died. This is the year of death. She's going to be left with either married filing joint or married filing separate. Those are going to be her two choices for the year her husband dies. Next, if you are divorced on the last day of the year, you are considered single for the entire year and you may not file as married. And finally, if you are married on the last day of the year, you are considered married for the entire year and you are not eligible to use the single filing status. Let's look at married, filing a joint return next. And throughout my courses, I typically abbreviate married filing joint into MFJ and married filing separate into MFS. So if you run across those abbreviations anywhere in any course I teach, that's what I mean. You can choose married filing jointly as your filing status if you are married and both you and your spouse agree to file a joint return. On a married filing joint return, you will both report your combined income and deduct your combined allowable expenses, and of course this includes your worldwide income for both of you. Now married filing jointly usually is the most advantageous filing status for a married couple, but sometimes it's not. It is possible in certain situations for married filing joint to arrive at a higher rate of tax than married filing separate, but I typically only see this occur when the incomes are relatively equal and there are deductions that they want to claim that are subject to phase-outs. For example, they're claiming employee business expenses or they are claiming medical expenses. Because medical expenses, of course, for most taxpayers are subject to a 10% limit based on AGI and employee business expenses are subject to a 2% limit on AGI. And if your incomes are relatively equal and you file separately, then your limit is 2% of your separate incomes rather than 2% of your combined incomes. The only time I really see a tax benefit come into play from the married filing separate status is when those types of deductions are in play. But sometimes the scenario works out that it still comes out to your benefit even where you're not claiming those deductions. It's just very rare. Usually any tax savings that my clients can possibly achieve is wiped out by the extra fee I charge to prepare two tax returns. Now if you file a joint return, you and your spouse are jointly responsible for tax and any interest or penalty due on your joint return. One spouse may be held responsible for all of the tax due even if the other spouse earned all of the income. And to be considered valid, a joint return must generally be signed by both the taxpayer and spouse. So I can tell you that I have had a situation where a client came to me and said that the IRS treated her tax return as filed even though her spouse forged her signature. So a married filing joint tax return was filed by her spouse who forged her signature. And she argued that that tax return should not have been accepted by the IRS. And the IRS came back and said, yes, 
Normally, we would accept that argument. However, you yourself did not ever independently attempt to file a tax return, and we have no evidence that you ever filed a separate tax return. Enough time has passed that we've essentially think it's too late for you to have any impact on this decision that your spouse made to file for you. Aside from that one example I've given you, the rule is that you typically have to both sign the return. We hope you've enjoyed this tax education class. Pacific Northwest Tax School is approved as a CE provider by the IRS and the states of Oregon, New York, and Texas. We have been awarded the Quality Assurance Standard by NASBA and meet the CE requirements for CPAs in most U.S. states and territories. Tax clients demand knowledge and experience. Pacific Northwest Tax School provides the in-depth, practical education needed to improve your understanding of tax law and to meet the demands of the competitive tax preparation industry. Click on the link shown here to purchase the manual for this course, enroll in the full course to receive CE credit, or browse our course catalog. Now, if you file jointly, you cannot choose to file separately after the due date of the return. And this is a question that it frequently appears on examinations here in Oregon. I'm sure it would appear on the IRS's enrolled agent exam as well, because it's a pretty important point. If you file a joint return with your spouse, and later on you have a change of heart, maybe you're going through a rough time, you're thinking about separating, or you're actually getting a divorce, and you're thinking, you know what, I find this joint return with my spouse, I no longer want to have that responsibility for that joint tax liability that was reflected on that return. I think there's even a possibility that he cheated. I want to file separately and get out of that. Well, you can't. If the due date for filing that return, typically April 15th, has passed, you cannot go back and amend it to separate. Now, the only exception to that rule is where a surviving spouse files a joint return. The executor or administrator of the estate has one year from the filing deadline of that return to come along and change the filing status to married filing separate and force a separate filing. But aside from that, once you file jointly, if the due date of the return passes, you cannot go separate. So if you have a married couple that has decided to file separately after they file jointly, they can only do so if they file that amended return before the due date of the return. April 15th. And we actually did have couples do that this year. They filed jointly, and then before April 15th hit, they decided to file separately. <laughs> and I'm going to get into the provisions for married filing separate, and I'll explain why that couple decided to do it. We've had at least three clients I know of this tax season who've elected to file separate for the same reason. It had nothing to do with their tax liability. All right, so let's take a look at married filing separate. Married filing separate is generally the least favorable filing status. If you can avoid it, you should because you're usually going to pay more tax. Married filing separate taxpayers are subjected to many restrictions that often cause them to pay more tax than if they file jointly. For example, married filing separate taxpayers do not qualify to claim student loan interest deduction or the child independent care credit or education credits or the tuition and fees deduction or the earned income credit or the adoption exclusion or credit. Also, if you file separately, more of your Social Security or railroad retirement benefits could become taxable. Generally, you will not be able to deduct passive rental real estate losses. And also, your capital loss carryover is limited to only $1,500 a year rather than $3,000. And if you file married filing separate, you can change your filing status to married filing joint by filing an amended tax return. And if you're doing this to claim a refund, you need to do it within the three-year statute of limitations, usually from the due date of the return. So let's talk a little bit about this married filing separate status and what makes it so awful. Well, typically, couples will look at filing a joint return together and they'll see that they owe a particular tax bill, and they'll wonder if we file separately, will things come out better? Usually it is not the case, and especially it's not the case if you have one spouse with income much higher than the other spouse. Something that might be going through the mind of the spouse is there, you know, one spouse earns 20000 the other earns 30000 they have a couple of kids at home, and they're thinking, well, you know, if we file one of us as head of household and the other is single, we can get earned income credit, we can get all of these tax benefits, but if we file jointly with $50,000 of income, we earn too much for earned income credit, we get less standard deduction than we do separately with one of us head of household, can't we go ahead and do that? And there's a lot of either unscrupulous tax preparers or incompetent tax preparers that allow that to go on on a regular basis. So the IRS is savvy to that and looks for it. 
they pull tax returns where they think the filing status choice is questionable. But there are other situations where clients may have legitimate reasons for filing separately, even though their tax will be higher when they do so. For example, you have spouses going through separation and divorce. And I had a situation with that this tax season, and in fact, a client named Natasha. <laughs> She's been married for a number of years to this same gentleman, and he likes to prepare the returns and have her sign them. And as she's going through the divorce proceedings, she was advised by her attorney that she'd be better be very, very careful about any tax return she signs with him. And he recommended that she come see a professional. So she ended up in my desk in front of me, and I started taking a look at this tax return. Well, there were all kinds of deductions being claimed on it for this business. And I said to her, well, I can't really verify the accuracy of these expenses for this business on here without really seeing the financial records, you know, or how he calculated these deductions. And she says, well, he's not really running a business. I don't think any of that's correct. I said, okay, well, if he's not running a business, then this negative number on the front of the tax return for business losses, we have to throw that out. And if that gets thrown out, then the Social Security income he has, well, more of it's going to be taxable. And then we moved over to the Schedule A, and I said, well, okay, we've got this much here for charity. Do you have any records to show this charity? And she says, I don't know anything about giving money to charity. I didn't do it, and I'm pretty sure he didn't do it. So the bottom line was I concluded that this was a completely false return, and the last thing that she should do is sign it because she could be held liable for its accuracy. So I said to her, well, here's the deal. It happens to be the case that even if we take all of these fraudulent information off and prepare a truthful tax return, you're still better off filing jointly than you are separately. The overall tax bill will be lower. And so she thought, of, should I file with him or not? She finally decided since it would save her money, she should go and ask him to sign the return. But the thing was, what was interesting about the scenario was that his only income was Social Security. And if she files with him, he becomes liable for any tax owed on the joint return, and really almost all of the tax liability associated with that joint return was due to her. Whereas if he files separately and reports only his Social Security income, he had a mortgage in his name, deductions he could claim in his name, and he would have zero tax liability. So from his side, there was no benefit to filing jointly with her, and from her side, there was benefit in filing jointly with him, but only if it was a truthful return. And ultimately, he refused to sign a truthful return or any return at all. So she ended up filing separately. But the next thing we went into was this child that the couple had and who was going to get to claim that child. And ultimately, we had a situation where she did move out. And she wanted to be able to claim the child because she'd provided most of that child's support for the year. She'd lived with the child most of the year. But when it came right down to it, the child lived with the father more than he had lived with the mother. And so she had to file married filing separate with no dependent. So it was a, not a great deal for her. So that's one scenario where just because of the divorce situation, they're going to be better off filing separately. So I was going to go on to the second example of where a couple could choose to file separately. And this tax season, I'm aware of at least three, possibly four, and these are just the ones I heard about coming into our firm, that made a decision to file separately rather than to file jointly for something completely unrelated to their tax situation or how well they liked each other. <laughs> In every situation, it had to do with student loans and the payments due on those student loans by one of the couples. So in every situation, we had student loans with payments that need to be made. And if the couple filed a joint return, the amount that needed to be paid on a monthly basis into those student loans went up astronomically by several hundred dollars a month even in certain cases. So by filing separately, the spouse that was indebted to the student loan could be put on a plan that had the student loan payments being much, much less. So even though they paid more tax filing separately, they chose to file separately and pay that extra tax in order to keep the payments on the student loans reduced. So as a political issue and as a moral issue, I could go on and on and on about that particular matter, but it really has nothing more to do with the story today than to say it is a motivating reason why clients are filing separately, and I'm seeing quite a bit of it this year. Head of household. Well, we're now going to move on to the filing status, which is, you could say, the holy grail of filing status is so many filers want to claim it, want to benefit from it, and tax preparers want to be able to give them that filing status for all the good things that come with it, but they can't. 
Now, the other thing that I see go on with head of household filing status is sometimes there's no benefit to the status whatsoever. And the filer or the tax preparer will give the head of household status without any tax benefit associated with it, plus the client not being eligible for it. And when you remember that head of household filing status is a factor that the IRS looks for when it's determining whether or not to audit someone, you definitely don't want to claim the status unless you're really sure they qualify for it. And there's certain situations where it's abundantly obvious that the person doesn't qualify for it. So we're going to spend some time talking about the status now. You may be able to file as head of household if you meet all of the following tests. You must be unmarried. Unmarried means you're not married. So if you're married, you probably can't use the head of household filing status unless you meet this test for being considered unmarried. So the considered unmarried means, well, you really are married, but we'll treat you as if you weren't married on the last day of the year. Now, if you paid more than half the cost of keeping up a home for a year, that is a test that you must meet. So to be head of household, you must be unmarried or considered unmarried, plus you must have paid more than half the cost of keeping up a household for the year. You must also have a qualifying person who lives with you in your home for more than half the year. However, if the qualifying person is your parent, your parent does not need to live with you. And finally, the qualifying person must be your dependent unless that individual is your qualifying child. So if we look back to the original question that I put up in front of you at the start of the class, the most frequently missed question from the consultant exam, why was that person not eligible to claim head of household status when he supported a household in which his mother lived for the entire year? The answer is he did not meet the test for being considered unmarried because he didn't have a qualifying child living with him. Now, there is also the rule about being head of household when you don't have a qualifying child. And if you don't have a qualifying child, then the person has to be related to you. So they have to be related to you or they have to be a qualifying child. Now, if you qualify as head of household, your tax rate is usually lower than the rates for a single or a married filing separate, which is what makes it desirable. So what does it mean to be considered unmarried? Well, you are considered unmarried on the last day of the year if you are not married or you are legally separated under a divorce decree or separate maintenance decree. Even if you are married, you are considered to be unmarried if you meet all of the following tests. Firstly, you file a separate return. Also, you paid more than half the cost of keeping up your home for the year. Your spouse did not live with you in your home during the last six months of the tax year, but temporary absence such as military assignment, school, or nursing home are still considered to be time spent at home. Your home was the main home of your qualifying child, stepchild, adopted child, or eligible foster child for more than half the year, and you must be able to claim an exemption for that child. However, you can still meet the test to be considered unmarried if the only reason you can't claim your child's exemption is because the non-custodial parent is allowed to claim the exemption for the child. So we're going to look at a couple of illustrations. In illustration number one, we have a married person who meets the test for being considered unmarried. And in illustration number two, we have a married person who does not meet the test for being considered unmarried. And illustration two is pretty much a replica of that question I showed you at the start of the class. So let's look first at illustration number one. Sylvia is married, and during the year she paid more than half the cost of maintaining a home for herself and her 10-year-old son. Sylvia's husband did not live with her during the last six months of the year. Sylvia will not be filing a joint return, and Sylvia cannot claim her son as a dependent because she signed Form 8332 releasing her son's dependency exemption to her husband. Sylvia meets all five tests being considered unmarried, and she can file as head of household even though she is not claiming her child's dependency exemption. Illustration number two. Wilma is a 42-year-old married individual who did not live with her spouse at any time during the year. Wilma paid all costs of keeping up her household in which she lived with her dependent mother, Susan, for the entire year. Wilma will not file a joint return with her spouse. Although Susan qualifies as Wilma's dependent, she is not Wilma's qualifying child, and as such, Wilma does not meet the test for being considered unmarried and is not eligible to claim the head of household filing status. Since she's not filing a joint return with her spouse, her only option available to her is going to be married filing separate. And the final of the filing status is qualifying widow. 
with dependent child. This is the rarest of all filing statuses. I almost never see it. Married filing separate is fairly rare too, but qualifying widow, I don't think I've done one in the last three years. That's how uncommon they are. But if you have a client that qualifies for this status, it obviously confers some good benefits. This particular filing status entitles you to use the joint return tax rates and the highest standard deduction amounts if you do not itemize. You are eligible to file your 2014 return as a qualifying widow with a dependent child if you meet all of the following tests. Firstly, you were entitled to file a joint return with your spouse for the year that your spouse died, but it does not matter whether you actually did file a joint return. Number two, you did not remarry before the end of the year. Number three, you have a qualifying child, stepchild, or adopted child for whom you can claim an exemption, but this does not include a foster child. This child lived with you in your household all year except for temporary absences. You paid more than half the cost of keeping up a home that is the main home for you and that child for the entire year except for temporary absences. And finally, your spouse died in either 2012 or 2013. And so the general rule for head of household is that in the year of death, you must file married filing separate or married filing joint. But for two years following the year of death, if you have a qualifying child, you can qualify to use the qualifying widow or widower with dependent child. And for 2014, those two preceding years are 13 or 12. And for 2015, which we're now going into, if the spouse dies in 14 or 13, then in 2015, the qualifying widow status would apply. So let's take a look at the summary of the different filing status choices that are available to filers. So we have the filing status options of single, married filing joint, married filing separate, head of household, or qualifying widow. And we've placed an X to the marital situation that could qualify you to use that status. So if you are single, for example, you can use the single filing status. If you're divorced, you can use the single filing status. And if you are widowed with a dependent child, you can use the single filing status. For married filing joint, you must be married. Or if you are widowed, you can use the married filing joint status, but only in the year of death. For married filing separate, you would file married filing separate. To file that status, you must be married. Or if you are widowed, it has to be the year of death. For head of household, you must be single, but you could be married if you meet the test for being considered unmarried. Or you can qualify for head of household if you are divorced. And you can also qualify as head of household if you are widowed, obviously other than the year of death. And then qualifying widow or widower with dependent child, the only time you can qualify for that filing status is if you are widowed with a dependent child. So we take the same information in the first table and rearrange it a little in the second table. And these are the filing statuses that are available for different situations. So you can use the single filing status if you are single. And you can use the married filing joint status whether you are married living together or married living apart. You can use the married filing separate status, whether you are married living together or married living apart. For head of household, you can use that status if you meet all of the tests for head of household and you are single, divorced, widowed, or married and living apart from your spouse for all of the last six months of the year. And qualifying widow, in order to claim that, you have to be widowed and you have to have a qualifying child. I'm going to put up some more poll questions. Question number one. Tessa is married to John. And John moved out of the house in July. Tessa paid over half the cost of maintaining her home for her dependent child list all possible filing statuses available for Tessa. Well, Tessa has two choices only. Her husband moved out in July. That means he lived with her at some point during the last six months of the year. Even if it was July 1st, he was in the house for one night during the last half of the year. She can't file as head of household because she fails the test for being considered unmarried when she is married. So it boils down to married filing joint or married filing separate. If she can come to an agreement with her spouse, they can file jointly. If not, she should file separate, but head of household is out. The next question we come across is Samantha. She's married to Mark, and they live in San Francisco. Samantha wants to file single because they were married in September and were unmarried for more than half the year. List all possible filing statuses. Married filing joint, married filing separate are the options available. Single is off the chart. No, it's not allowed. Zeta Smith, the next problem, question number three, divorced her husband in December. And Zeta's 30-year-old single daughter, Beth, lived in Zeta's home all year. 
Beth didn't work much last year and earned only $3,900. Therefore, Beth is a qualifying relative, and Zeta can claim her as a dependent. Zeta paid more than half the cost of keeping up her home at Hippity Hop Lane, lists all possible filing statuses allowable for Zeta. Single is correct. That is, of course, an option available to her, but actually head of household is an option as well. Her 30-year-old daughter can qualify her as head of household because that child is a, meets the test for being a qualifying relative. So we're going to be getting into the qualifying relative and qualifying child tests coming up shortly. Then finally, we have Zeta's situation is the same as in question three, except that her daughter Beth worked all year and does not qualify as a qualifying relative. As soon as the child works and is no longer a qualifying relative, then the only filing status available to Zeta is single. All right, so let's move on to the next topic of the day, which is personal exemptions and dependents. And let's talk about exemptions and what's great about them. An exemption is a deduction, a tax deduction, that reduces your taxable income. For 2014, you can generally claim an exemption deduction of $3,950 for each exemption on your tax return. Form 1040 provides for two types of exemptions the personal spousal exemption, which is claimed on line 6A and 6B, and the dependency exemption that is claimed on 6C. And in order to claim a dependency exemption, you must show that the individual for whom you are claiming an exemption was either a qualifying child or a qualifying relative. If the person you want to claim a dependency exemption for does not meet the test for either qualifying child or qualifying relative, you are not allowed to claim a deduction for them. There are limits on exemptions. Your exemption deduction can be reduced or eliminated if your income rises above a certain level based on your filing status. Now, this particular reduction in the deduction for exemptions was eliminated for tax years 2010 through 2012. The phase out was reintroduced in 2013 and is here again in 2014. My comment is never fear whether the exemption deduction is allowed or not. If you are in these income ranges, alternative minimum tax is going to take that kid away from you anyway, <laughs> and yourself. So anyone who falls into these income ranges is probably paying alternative minimum tax, and under the rules for alternative minimum tax, you don't get dependency exemptions. So the phase-outs really have little effect on the tax liability of most taxpayers because even if they do claim the exemption, AMT takes it away. And if they don't claim the exemption, then they pay less AMT, and it's all an even wash. If you want to know more about AMT and how that works, I actually teach a course called Understanding the Alternative Minimum Tax. And when you are finished with that course, hopefully you'll understand all of these details. Next lineup is personal exemptions. And the following rules apply to personal exemption. For a single person, you can claim your own personal exemption if you are not a dependent of someone else. If another taxpayer is entitled to claim you as a dependent, you cannot take an exemption for yourself even if the other person decides not to claim your exemption. And this actually comes up quite often. I'll have a parent say to me, well, um, little Joe, you know, he, he turned 17 this year and he got a job and you know, he earned some money, so I'm not going to claim him as a dependent. I want him to claim himself this year. Well, it doesn't actually work like that. Yes, parent, you can decide not to claim your child's exemption, but it doesn't mean he gets to claim his own. Because if he meets the test for being your child, your qualifying child or your qualifying relative, he's not allowed to claim his exemption regardless of what you decide to do. So the personal exemption is not something that you buy and sell or give to someone or take away from someone. With limited exceptions, the personal exemption and the dependency exemptions are established under law. And if you are entitled to claim them, you can claim them. And if you are entitled to claim them, anyone else out there who might want them isn't necessarily entitled to them. Married, you are generally allowed one exemption for your spouse, and if you are married filing a joint return, one exemption for your spouse. You may claim an exemption for your spouse on a married filing separate return, however, but only if the spouse had no gross income and was not the dependent of another taxpayer. So let's just suppose, this could happen, you're married during the year, your spouse had no gross income, and it comes time to file a tax return, your spouse refuses to sign the return. So you go, okay, I'm going to have to file separately, but my spouse had no income. You could actually claim an extra exemption for your spouse if they had no income. 
And so you'd be filing married, filing separate with two exemptions. It rarely comes up. I've done it one or two times over the years. And on at least one of those times, as soon as we did it, this letter was triggered from the state of Oregon saying, rick, 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 rick. but it was allowed. And after writing letters explaining the position, it was allowed. But it is an odd thing that doesn't come up too often. Deaths. If your spouse died during the year, you generally claim your spouse's exemption under the same rules that apply to married people. If you remarry during the year, you cannot claim an exemption for your deceased spouse. However, if you have no income, your exemption may be claimed by both your new spouse and your deceased spouse on their married filing separate returns. And finally, divorced or separated spouse, if you obtain a final decree of divorce or separation by the end of the year, you cannot claim your former spouse's exemption. And this rule applies even if you provided all of your former spouse's support for the year. All right, I'm going to put up the first password of the day. Jot that password down. EMU, E-M-U, EMU. All right, then, welcome back from break, everyone. And we're going to continue on with where we left off, which was a discussion of exemptions. And just before the break, we discussed what needed to happen in order for you to claim a personal exemption, either your own personal exemption or also the spousal exemption for you and your spouse. But in addition to the personal exemptions, there are also dependency exemptions. And these are the more complicated ones to determine. I want to claim this person as a dependent. Can I? Usually, very often, the desire to claim someone outweighs the ability to claim it. Most recently, I had an individual in my office, and I was really struggling to see if I could give her a dependent, and in the end, I just couldn't do it. They were close, close, but just didn't quite make it, and I, I may come to that example when we get to the appropriate point. So let's talk about dependency exemptions. So determining who qualifies as your dependent should be simple. However, it is often confusing, and if you recall, at the very start of the class, I threw up a scenario for Natasha where she wants to claim her son's exemption but cannot because she is beaten under the tiebreaker rules with her spouse when she moved out of the house. So it isn't always as obvious as it should seem. Very often the claiming of a dependent can be quite a contentious issue, and there's often hundreds or thousands of dollars attached in tax benefits to every dependent that a person might be interested in claiming. So correctly determining whom you can and whom you cannot claim as a dependent is one of the most important areas of the tax return, and it's certainly an area that the IRS is going to explore during an audit. Sometimes these audits are in person where they want you to come into the office and prove entitlement to a child. Just as often, perhaps even more often, the IRS will send out letter audits and basically say, prove to us you're entitled to this particular dependency exemption by mailing us a list of all of these documents. And if you can't prove your entitlement to a child's exemption or to a non-child exemption, then the IRS can take that benefit away from you. So the rules summarized in Table 3.1, coming up next, are applied through a series of tests. And there is one test for yourself plus additional tests for each type of dependent, either qualifying child or qualifying relative. And every test must be met or you cannot claim an exemption for this person. So this particular table is a summary of the rules that apply to claiming an individual as a qualifying child or claiming a person to be a qualifying relative. They are summarized in the table in Publication 17, and we're going to look at the summary of the rules as described in the table, and then we're going to go into each rule in greater detail. The first rule is that you cannot claim any dependents if you or your spouse are filing a joint return can be claimed as a dependent by someone else. Also, you cannot claim a married person who files as joint return as a dependent unless that joint return is filed only to claim a refund of withheld income tax or estimated tax paid. And essentially, no tax would be owed on their married filing separate returns. You cannot claim a person as a dependent unless that person is a United States citizen, a U.S. resident alien, a U.S. national, or a resident of Canada or Mexico. You cannot claim a person as a dependent unless that person is your qualifying child or qualifying relative, and that's where we get into the test to be a qualifying child or the test to be a qualifying relative. Firstly, the test to be a qualifying child. The child must be your son, daughter, stepchild, foster child, brother, sister, half-brother, half-sister, stepbrother, stepsister, or a descendant of any of them, for example, a niece or nephew or a great-grandchild. The child must be under age 19 at the end of the year and younger than you or your spouse if filing jointly. 
under age 24 at the end of the year, a student and younger than you, or your spouse if filing jointly, or the child can be any age, but they are permanently and totally disabled. The child must have lived with you for more than half the year. The child must not have provided more than half of his or her own support for the year. And the child must not file a joint return for the year unless the return is filed only to get a refund of income tax paid or estimated tax paid. So that's a summary of the rules for qualifying child. Let's compare those with the rules for qualifying relative. To be a qualifying relative, the first rule is that the person you want to claim as a qualifying child cannot be your qualifying child or the qualifying child of anyone else. So if a particular person qualifies as a qualifying child of anybody, they cannot be anyone's qualifying relative. Next, the person must either be related to you in one of the ways listed under relatives who do not have to live with you or must live with you all year as a member of your household and the relationship must not violate local law. The person's gross income for the year must be less than $3,950, which is equal to the exemption deduction, and you must provide more than half of that person's total support for the year. So there's a bunch of rules that we've just gone through for each of these particular types of dependents, and we're going to take them each in turn and look at them very closely, beginning with the dependency test for qualifying child. You cannot claim any dependents if you or your spouse, if filing jointly, could be claimed as a dependent by another taxpayer. To claim an exemption for a qualifying child, you must meet all seven of these tests. And these tests are not described as seven tests really in the same way. I'm going to give them to you in IRS Pub 17, but they are essentially covered in Pub 17 in a similar fashion. We have the joint return test, the citizen or U.S. resident test, the relationship test, the age test, the residency test, the support test, and the special test for a qualifying child of more than one person. So let's look firstly at this joint return test. You generally cannot claim an exemption for your dependent if he or she files a joint return. However, if your dependent files a joint return merely to claim a refund and no tax liability would exist for either spouse on married filing separate returns, then you can still claim your dependent's exemption. I want to show you what I mean when I say tax liability. Lots of people don't have that clearly in their head, and as such, they can be confused by what it really means. So this is the 1040. And in the 1040, you list all the people that you're going to claim as dependents up here. And then you get over to page 2 of the return. And on line 42, you enter the deduction you get for your exemptions. Well, one of the rules is that if you want to claim an exemption deduction for someone on line 42, that person cannot file a joint return with someone else unless the only reason they're filing a joint return with someone else is to claim a refund of tax withheld or tax paid in, and no liability exists on the joint return or would exist on married filing separate returns if they filed separately. So let's take a look what we mean by tax liability. Well, essentially, tax liability is the number that appears on line 63. It has nothing to do with the withholding over here. If you have withholding that exceeds your liability, then you have a refund. But having a refund is different than having zero tax. You really need to have a situation that no liability would exist on the separate returns or on the joint returns. So that when you get down to line 63, it's a big goose egg. Typically, that's going to happen if the income on line 38 is fairly low and the standard deduction amount that they claim is enough that it wipes out any tax they have. And there's other taxes that can kick in here in the form of self-employment tax and household employment taxes healthcare credits and so forth. So these can all impact whether or not your dependent has a liability. And if your dependent has a liability and files a joint return, you automatically are not entitled to claim them. But if they have no liability, because line 63 is essentially zero, and they choose to file a joint return, you can still claim their exemption as long as you can show they owed no tax. So that's what that statement means. Going back to where we left off, the next test is the citizen or U.S. resident test. For some part of the calendar year, a person must be a U.S. citizen or resident or a resident of Canada or Mexico. Canada and Mexico are special. They border the United States to the south and the north. And if your dependent lives in one of those two nations, you can claim them as long as you can show they meet all of the dependency tests, either under qualifying relative or qualifying child. Now, if your dependent lives in Cuba or in Australia or in England or in China or in Guatemala, you cannot claim them unless they are a U.S. citizen or resident.
Next, we have the relationship test. To meet this test, a person must be your child, grandchild, great-grandchild, etc., or a stepchild. A stepchild is a child of your spouse. And note that a stepchild cannot be a child of your boyfriend or girlfriend. So this is one that I have just seen many times over the years. client will come in and they'll say, yeah, I'm claiming my stepchild is a dependent this year. And so I get the Social Security card for this stepchild that they're going to be claiming, and I look at the Social Security card and I go, okay, well, your name is Smith, and this stepchild has the last name Jones. Why isn't the father of this child claiming him as a dependent? Why are you claiming him as a dependent? Oh, well, my boyfriend, he ain't working this year. (laughs) Well, that's not the question. The question is, okay, so your boyfriend is not your spouse, and if your boyfriend is not your spouse, then his child cannot be your stepchild. So there has to be marriage there. So one of the things that I've grown savvy to, because clients can get savvy to this as well, is how they spin their story when they come in. And one of the things you can do to be on the lookout for, you could say, underhandedness, trickery that is deliberate, but on certain occasions can also be quite innocent and naive because they don't know better. But I would say often they know what they're doing and they've thought it through very carefully, but sometimes they're completely innocent. And either way, you need to be on your guard. So one of the first things I do when I have a client come in that wants to claim a dependent is I look to the name on the Social Security card. If it's the same last name as the filer, then it's natural to believe that they probably have a dependent here. And if the child has a different last name, it doesn't mean that they don't have a dependent, but it means that you need to be more diligent in your questioning. The first question that I always have is, why does the child have a different name? Usually the child has a different name because they've taken their father's name or because they're not the child of the person who's trying to claim them at all. So when I do see a child has a different name, I'm going to say, okay, you're claiming this child. Where is the child's father? And how is the child related to you? And so I'm asking the questions to determine how this relationship works. And if the client is not able to satisfy me that there is a legitimate relationship here through blood, then it's going to get difficult to claim that child's exemption. Not impossible, because you can claim a person as a dependent who is not related to you, but there's a number of tests in order to claim them. Under none of the tests would they meet the test for being a qualifying child, because they're not your child. (laughs) They might qualify as a qualifying relative. But if they're not related to you, they can never be your qualifying child. And if they are related to you, then they need to be related in one of these ways. Child, grandchild, great-grandchild, a stepchild that is a legitimate child of your spouse or ex-spouse. An eligible foster child, but only if that person was placed with you by an authorized agency or basically a sibling or a descendant of any of them. The next test we have is the age test. And to meet this test, a child must be under age 19 at the end of the year and younger than you or your spouse of filing jointly. A full-time student under the age of 24 at the end of the year and younger than you or your spouse if you are filing jointly or permanently and totally disabled at any time during the year regardless of age. And here is an example of how this test can work against you. Your 23-year-old brother who is a full-time student and unmarried lives with you and your spouse. He is not disabled. Both you and your spouse are 21 years old and you file a joint return. Your brother is not your qualifying child because he is not younger than you or your spouse. Residency test. To meet this test, a child must have lived with you for more than half the year. But there are exemptions for temporary absences, which are due to illness, education, business, vacation, or military service, or death or birth of the child during the year, or a kidnapped child if all of the following is true. The child is presumed by law enforcement to have been kidnapped by someone who is not a member of the child's family. In the year the kidnapping occurred, the child lived with you for more than half of the part of the year before the date of the kidnapping. There is no determination in a prior year that the child is dead and the child would still be under age 19. Divorced or separated parents. A child will be treated as the qualifying child of the non-custodial parent if all of the following apply. The parents are divorced or legally separated under decree of divorce or separate maintenance, separated under a written separation agreement, or lived apart at all times during the last six months of the year. The child received over half of his or her support from the parents. The child is in the custody of one or both parents for more than half the year, and a decree or written agreement that applies to 2014 provides that the non-custodial parent can claim the child as a dependent 
or the custodial parent signs a written declaration such as Form 8332 or a similar statement that he or she will not claim the child as a dependent for the year. Well, this child of divorced or separated parents, this is a really contentious issue. And for example, I already started the day off talking about my client, Natasha. She earned virtually all of the income for the household, paid most of the support for the household, provided virtually all of the support for her child for the year, and yet she loses because under the tiebreaker rules, she moved out before the end of the year and the child lived with the father more than with her. Now, is there a way for her to be able to claim the child's exemption? And the answer is yes, if the father signs 8332 and gives it to her and releases his right to claim that child. But if the father refuses to do it, she's basically out. No matter what seems fair, no matter what seems right, she's out. And that's one of the things we have to bear in mind when we're looking at dependency situations is we need to look at the rules clearly and apply them clearly and not let what we think feels right come into play. Because what we think feels right is not necessarily what's going to play out. Now, I have heard stories of IRS auditors getting these facts wrong as well. And one situation I can think of that comes up is if you're looking here, it says, for children of divorced or separated parents, a non-custodial parent can claim the child who is in the custody of the other parent if they meet all of these tests. And one of these tests is that the child received over half of his or her support for the year from the parents. So let's think about a situation where they would not meet that test. Let's suppose we've got Sally. It seems like she's going to be a dependent of her mother and father, but they've been separated the entire year, and the mother is actually living with her parents. And so Sally and her mom are living with her mom's parents. In other words, they're all living with her grandparents, and dad is off somewhere else. And dad wants to be able to claim the dependency exemption for Sally. And mom's ready to sign an 8332 to allow that to happen. Thing is it has to be established that the grandparents did not provide more than half the support. If Sally's been living in her grandparents' house all year with her mother, and the grandparents have been providing a household, providing food, providing virtually all financial support, then the mother and the father are not going to be able between themselves to show that they provided more than half the support. And so if that's the case, the mother would not be able to sign the dependency exemption over the father. However, the mother might be able to claim it herself. Because under the tiebreaker rule, she doesn't need to show she paid more than half of the support for the child. She only needs to show that she meets all of the tests for the child. And the support test with children applies only to did the child provide more than half of his or her own support. So this particular rule, rule number four about children of divorced or separated parents, has to do with a situation where the non-custodial parent wants to claim the child. And in that situation, the non-custodial parent could claim the child so long as it can be shown that more than half the support of the child was paid by both parents. And if that cannot be shown, the non-custodial parent is out, and then the dependency exemption really rests with where that child lives. If the child lived all year with the mother, and the mother can show that the child did not pay more than half of her own support, then she can claim that child's support even if the grandparents provided virtually all of the support. But Sally, under the tiebreaker rules, could allow the parents to claim the child. That can get complicated, but let's move on to the next support test. To meet this test, the child cannot have provided more than half of his or her own support for the year. To see what is or is not support, refer to publication 17, page 34, to the support test. And we're going to get into that a little bit more a little bit later. But note, if a child is supported by state welfare, housing, or other benefits, such support is considered to have been provided by a qualifying relative, but is not considered to be support provided by a qualifying child. So under the support test for a qualifying child, you merely need to show that the child did not pay more than half of his or her own support. And if support comes from the state, that support is not considered to be provided by the child. But when we move over to the qualifying relative test, state support is considered to be support provided by the relative. Special test for qualifying child of more than one person. If you and another person have the same qualifying child, you and the other person can decide which of you will treat the child as a qualifying child. That person can take all of the following tax benefits provided the person is eligible for each benefit based on that qualifying child. For example, the exemption for the child, the child tax credit, 
the head of household filing status, the credit for child and dependent care expenses, the exclusion from income for dependent care benefits, and the earned income credit. The other person cannot take any of these benefits based on the same qualifying child. In other words, you and the other person cannot agree to divide these tax benefits between you. Now, there was a period in the past where you could divide them between you, but that ended way back in 2004. So it could be way back sometime before 2004 you learned that you could divide benefits. But it's been gone for a decade now, so you can just sweep that from your mind. When it comes to the benefits associated with a dependent, it's all or nothing. All right. Now, if you and the other person who both have a qualifying child that is the same child cannot agree on who will claim that child, then the tiebreaker rules apply. So let's take a look at the tiebreaker rules. If more than one person files a return claiming the same qualifying child, and only one of the persons is the child's parent, then the parent wins. If two of the persons are parents of the child and they do not file a joint return together, then the person who wins is the parent with whom the child lived for the longer period of time during the year. If two or more persons are parents of the child, they do not file a joint return together, and the child lived with each parent the same amount of time during the year, then the parent that wins is the one that has the highest income. If none of the persons are the child's parent, then the winner is the person with the highest AGI. And if either parent can claim the child but does not, then the person with the highest AGI, so long as it is higher than any of the parent's AGI. So remember that example I was giving you with the, the grandchild Sally living with her parent in the grandparent's house and father over here wants to claim that the grandparents are providing all of the support? Dad's out. He doesn't have a qualifying child. So now you look at the two people who do have qualifying child. It's the mother of Sally and the grandparents of Sally. And under the tiebreaker rules, mom wins, even if she provided virtually no support for Sally at all. She only needs to show that Sally did not provide more than half of her own support. So let's just suppose mom earns $5,000 for the entire year and the parents earn $80,000 and are supporting the mom and Sally. Well, mom at earning $5,000 has earned too much to be a, a dependent of her parents. She qualifies to claim Sally, but she could choose to give Sally's dependency exemption to her parents so long as the parents have higher AGI, which in that illustration they did. So let's look at another illustration here. Tax benefit allocations with a child of parents who are living together. Wendy and Casper are an unmarried couple who have a son named Richie. Wendy, Casper, and Richie lived together as members of the same household all year. Wendy's wages were $20,000 and Casper's wages totaled $30,000 for the year. If Wendy and Casper agree, Wendy can claim all benefits associated with Richie, including the earned income credit, dependency, the child tax credit, the child independent care credit, and the head of household filing status. But wait a second. Wendy can claim head of household filing status only if she can show she paid more than half the cost of supporting the household in which her son, Richie, lives. If Wendy cannot meet the test for head of household filing status and she claims Richie's exemption, then both she and Casper will file using the same single filing status. Well, odds are that if Wendy's only earning $20,000 and Casper earns $30,000, she isn't head of the household. It's possible maybe Casper's spending all of his money on himself going to school and Wendy's supporting the household. It's possible that a person with less income could be head of household, but unlikely. So if Casper decides to claim Richie's exemption, he is entitled to all benefits. However, since Casper's income is higher than Wendy's, his earned income amount will be less than hers. So if we look at a balancing act here, and Wendy and Casper are both agreeing to go Whichever way gives the household the best benefit, you're going to have to run two scenarios, one with Casper being head of household and claiming the child and see where his tax comes out, and another with Wendy claiming Casper and filing as single and at the same time reverting Casper to single and then compare the tax. Whichever one comes out ahead is the one they should choose as long as they agree on it. And if they can't agree on who will claim the child, then Casper wins under the tiebreaker rules because he had the higher income. Tax benefit allocations with a person who is not a parent of the child. Under the tiebreaker rules, if a child qualifies as a dependent of more than one person and one of the persons is not the child's parent, but another is a parent, the parent can release the child's exemption to the other person, but only if that person's income is higher than the highest AGI of either parent otherwise entitled to claim the child. And here is an illustration. 
parent and grandparent allocation of tax benefits. Veronica is the single parent of daughter Becky. Veronica and Becky live with Veronica's mother, Artis. Artis' income is $40,000 and Veronica's income is $20,000. Because Artis' income is higher than Victoria's, Veronica can choose to allow Artis to claim Becky as the dependent. If Artis claims Becky's dependency exemption, she will be entitled to all benefits associated with Becky's dependency exemption, including the earned income credit, dependency, child tax credit, child independent care, and head of household. But here's a question. If Veronica decides to claim Becky's dependency exemption, what benefit is she not entitled to claim? It is head of household. Because Artis earned only $20,000, and in the wording of the problem, I tell you that her mother is paying all of the cost of keeping up the household, we know she can't possibly be head of household. But the other thing we see going on here is that Artis has $40,000 of income, which is high enough that she probably would not get any earned income credit. So it's a toss-up. Which is going to get, derive the biggest tax benefit, head of household or earned income credit? This family will have to discuss it amongst themselves. But if they cannot agree then artist is out. She has no option in there. The only way she can claim all of these particular benefits on her tax return is if Veronica decides to let her do it. All right here, qualifying child dependency flow chart. Now, way back before 2004, the IRS had a flow chart in Pub 17 for determining dependency. I liked that flow chart. I used it for many, many years in my classes. And with clients, you know, if they were sitting with me at my desk and we were having an argument about who could claim a dependent, I would just get out the flow chart and we'd go through it together. When we crossed the line that they either got the dependent or didn't get the dependent, they were often satisfied with the flow chart. Well, in 2004, the IRS rewrote the rules for dependency and introduced that table showing qualifying relative and qualifying child side by side. And things were never the same as far as I was concerned. I hated that table. I liked the flow chart. So in terms of teaching my classes, I kept the flow chart going, but I actually had to adapt the flow chart. It is not exactly the same as when IRS used to have it because they actually have new rules in place. But let's use the flow chart to go through the dependency tests. And these are the dependency tests for having a qualifying child. The first test on the flow chart is the dependent taxpayer test. Are you the dependent of another person? If the answer is yes, you're out. You cannot claim anyone as your qualifying child. But if you are not the dependent of another person, you move on to the joint return test. Did the child file a joint return for the year unless that return was filed only as a claim for refund? If the answer is yes, you're out. You don't have a dependent. But if the answer is no, you move on to the U.S. citizen or residence test. Was the child a U.S. citizen or resident or a resident of Canada or Mexico for any part of the year? If the answer is yes, you move on to the relationship test. Was the child your grandchild, stepchild, brother, sister, niece, nephew, or descendant thereof? or your eligible foster child, the answer must be yes, and if it is, you move on to the age test. Under the age test, was the child under age 19 and younger than you or your spouse if filing jointly, a full-time student under age 24 and younger than your spouse if filing jointly, or any age and permanently and totally disabled on the last day of the year? The answer must be yes, and if it is, you move on to the residency test. There are exceptions to residency that we discussed. In other words, time spent away is considered to be time spent at home in certain situations. But basically, the question is, did the child live with you for more than half the year? The answer must be yes, and if it is, you move on to the support test. Under the support test for qualifying child, the question is, did the child provide more than half of his or her own support? The question is not, did you provide more than half the support, but rather, did the child provide more than half of his or her own support? The answer must be no. If the answer is no, you move on to the special test for a qualifying child of more than one person. Is your child the qualifying child of anyone else? If the answer is no, you're done. You get to claim them. But if the answer is yes, does the other person agree to allow you to claim that child's exemption? If that other person is arguing with you and wants to claim the exemption for yourself, you move on to the next question. And that question is, do you win under the tiebreaker rules? If you win under the tiebreaker rules, you get that child regardless of what the other person says. But if you lose under the tiebreaker rules, you're done, you're out. You don't get that child's exemption. All right, let's move on now to the dependent or divorced or separated parents. We've been talking a little bit about this under the tiebreaker rules. We're going to focus on it a little more specifically now. As a reminder, beginning with 2009 returns, the custodial parent is the parent with whom the child spends the greatest number of nights during the year. And in an instant where the child spends an equal number of nights with each parent, then the custodial parent will be the one with the higher AGI. 
This topic comes up with my clients all the time. They've got joint custody of their child. They're divorced. Who gets the kid? And the answer is whoever, <laughs> unless the divorce decree specifies it, right? You know, sometimes they trade years. It's just specified in the divorce decree. But if the divorce decree does not specify it, then it ultimately falls to whoever had the child the most number of nights. And that means you should count the number of nights. You should keep a calendar on the wall, and every night that kid's in your house, put an X on the night. And at the end of the year, if you can show that the child was with you a minimum of 183 days, you win, and you get that child's exemption. But if you can't show that the child lived with you a minimum of 183 days, then it's going to fall to did the other parent provide a greater number of nights or was the child with the other parent a greater number of nights? And if it was the same number of nights, then it boils down to who earned the most money. Now, a non-custodial parent claiming an exemption for a child is no longer allowed to attach pages from the divorce decree agreement instead of from Form 8332 if the divorce agreement went into effect after 2008. So this rule has actually been around for a number of years now. Anyone who is divorced after 2008 actually has to have 8332 signed through the divorce process and then be attaching that to the return. But if the divorce decree went in before 2009, then it is still possible to attach pages of the divorce decree instead. The non-custodial parent must attach Form 8332 or a similar statement signed by the custodial parent. The signed statement must have the sole purpose of releasing the claim to the child's exemption, and the non-custodial parent must attach the required information even if it was filed with a return in an earlier year. Revocation of release to claim the child's exemption by the custodial parent. Well, Form 8332 actually has three parts to it. One of the parts is to release the exemption, and the other part is to unrelease the exemption. Perhaps you decided you were going to give the exemption away for several years, and then child support stops, or you get mad at the ex-spouse, or whatever, and you decide you're going to take it back. Well, there are provisions from preventing that happening during the tax season. So if you're going to stop allowing a release of exemption, you need to do so in the year before you want the stoppage to take effect. So for tax years beginning after July 2, 2008, which is the 2009 calendar year for most taxpayers, new rules apply which allow the custodial parent to revoke a release to a claim for an exemption that was previously released to the non-custodial parent on Form 8332 or a similar statement. The revocation is effective no earlier than the tax year following the year in which the custodial parent provides or makes reasonable effort to provide the non-custodial parent with the notice of revocation. Therefore, if the custodial parent provides notice of revocation to the non-custodial parent in 2014, the earliest tax year the revocation can be effective for is 2015. So let's just suppose partway through 2014, Sally decides that she no longer wants to allow her ex-spouse to claim their child's exemption. So she signs aid 8332 revoking that exemption right and gives it to her former spouse. That former spouse will be allowed to claim that child's exemption for 2014, but will not be allowed to claim it for tax year 2015. So let's take a look at 8332. I do fill out a few of these every tax season because I'm a very diligent tax preparer. And some of my clients have gotten pretty good about understanding why and when they need these and make sure I do them for them. Uh, in fact, I have a client. It's an interesting situation. She's fairly high income. She does benefit from head of household filing status but receives no benefit whatsoever from claiming her child's exemption. Under the divorce decree, she has every right to that child's exemption every year. She doesn't need to give it to the spouse. But I explained to her, you know, you actually don't benefit from claiming your son's exemption. You earn too much to claim the child tax credit. You earn too much to benefit from the dependency exemption. You're either phased out or AMT is taking it away. So why don't you just give it to your spouse and let him save some money? And so she says, yeah, I'd like to do that. And ever since I've told her that, every year she asks me this for this form and she signs it and she gives it to him. So let's take a look at what it's about. Part one is the release to claim the exemption for the year. And it says, I agree not to claim an exemption for the child's name, for tax year 2000 and blank. And in this case, my client would have had me fill this out for 2014. She signs the return and enters her social security number and the date. And then she gives this form to the ex-spouse and that allows the ex-spouse to claim that child's exemption. And then the ex-spouse should attach this form to his return. If he's electronically filing, he would need to attach form 8332 to form 8453 and mail that in separately or the e-file provider would do that. Now, in Part 2, 
It is possible to release a claim to an exemption for future years. I typically don't recommend my clients do this unless they have really, really good terms with the former spouse. But they can agree not to claim an exemption for the name of the child for a specific number of tax years and then sign it. Now, if you've given the exemption away for more years than you ultimately decide that you want to do and you want to revoke that election to give the release away for a number of years, you would fill out Part 3 and give it to the other parent. But, of course, if you give a revocation to the other parent in 2014, you're not going to be able to claim your child's exemption in 14. You'll be able to claim it again in 15. So those are the rules for claiming a qualifying child. Let's move on now to the test for claiming a qualifying relative. To claim an exemption for a qualifying relative, you must meet all six of the following tests. And I've boiled these down to the sentence here that Joe must come get supper now. In the olden days, we really had these five dependency tests that we would go through. And as we were preparing for exams, I would say to the students, okay, write down Joe must come get supper. And then IRS changed all of the rules and we had to add a now on the end. But let's go through and see what we're coming up with. The Joe corresponds to joint. The must corresponds to member of household or relationship. Come corresponds to citizen. Get corresponds to gross income. Supper corresponds to support. And now corresponds to not a qualifying child. So let's take a look at each of these in turn. So in order to claim a qualifying relative, you must meet all six of these tests. The joint return test, the member of household or relationship test, the citizen or resident test, the gross income test, the support test, and not a qualifying child test. Note that a good way to remember these is with the sentence here, the memory tool, Joe must come get supper now. Let's look at the first test in line. You generally cannot claim an exemption for your dependent if he or she files a joint return. However, if your dependent files a joint return merely to claim a refund and no tax liability would exist for either spouse on their married filing separate returns, then you can still claim your dependent's exemption. Next, we have the citizen or resident test. For some part of the calendar year, a person must be a U.S. citizen or resident or a resident of Canada or Mexico. And those first two tests are the same two tests that apply for a qualifying child. But the next test in line is unique. This test does not apply to a qualifying child. Member of Householder Relationship Test. To meet this test, a person must be either live with you for the entire year as a member of your household or be related to you in one of the following ways. Their child, grandchild, great-grandchild, etc., or a stepchild, or an eligible foster child. But remember on qualifying child, these three types of relationships also meet tests for qualifying child, as does brother, sister, half brother, half sister, and so forth. But then we move on to other categories of person who is considered to be related to you that would not meet the definition of a qualifying child but do meet the definition of a qualifying relative. And that is a parent, grandparent, or other direct ancestor but not a foster parent, a stepmother or a stepfather, a brother or sister of your parent, that is your aunt or uncle a son or daughter of your brother or sister, a niece or nephew, or a father-in-law, daughter-in-law, mother-in-law, son-in-law, brother-in-law, sister-in-law, etc. So in order to have, to have a qualifying relative, that person must live with you as a member of your household for the entire year if they're not related to you. But if they are related to you, they don't have to live with you at all. They just have to be related to you. But to be related to you and satisfy the relationship test, they have to be related in one of the ways shown here. So this particular test throws people off. They get all hung up that in order to claim a dependent, the person has to be related to you. That's not the case. They have to be related to you if they don't live with you. But if they do live with you for the entire year as a member of your household, they don't have to be related to you. So this is one of the things that often surprises clients and tax preparers. I have a client named Jessica. Her boyfriend lived with her the entire year as a member of her household. He's a student going to school. He had no income. Can she claim him as a dependent? The answer is absolutely. Could she qualify as head of household? No. Because in order to be head of household, he would have to be related to her, and he's not. But he does qualify as her dependent. So let's look at some special notes about relationship. Any relationship established by marriage is not ended by death or divorce. In other words, your in-laws will always remain your in-laws for tax purposes. Before legal adoption, a child is considered to be your child once placed with you by an authorized agency. An eligible foster child meets the relationship test and does not need to live with you to qualify as your dependent. 
Your cousin does not meet the relationship test and must live with you as a member of your household for the entire year. And cousin is one of the ones my clients try to pull over on me quite regularly. Oh, this is my cousin. I'm claiming him. Does he live with you? No, but I support him. Well, he's your cousin. He's not considered to be related to you. Because he's not related to you, he must live with you. A person who died during the year but was a member of your household until death will meet the member of household test. In this situation, the decedent is considered to have been a member of your household for the entire year. And a child who was born during the year will meet the member of household test if he or she lives with you for the remainder of the year. And remember that required hospital stay is considered to be time spent in your household if the child would otherwise have been a member of your household. So in other words, a child born during the year is considered to have lived with you for the entire year. And there are, sadly, situations where children are born and then die when they're still in the hospital. I had that once many, many years ago where a young couple came to me, their child was born, lived only for a few minutes, and then died still in the hospital. And they were able to claim that child's dependency exemption and the earned income credit, even though they didn't have a social security number for the child, because that child, for the brief period of time he was alive, was considered to have been a member of their household for the entire year and met all of the tests associated with dependency. Next up, we have gross income test. You generally cannot claim an exemption for your dependent if they had gross income of $3,950 or more for the year. This is a completely different test than the gross income test for qualifying child. Under qualifying child, the child can have any amount of income as long as it can be shown that the child did not provide more than half of his or her own support. Whereas under the gross income test for a qualifying relative, now we're very concerned about how much income there is, and if it's more than $3,950, they're out. Gross income includes all sources of income, whether or not they are used for support. However, gross income does not include tax-exempt income, such as Social Security payments, payments received by a permanently and totally disabled person for services they perform at certain sheltered workshops, or scholarships received by a degree candidate that are used for tuition fees, books, supplies, and equipment required for particular courses. The next test is the support test. You must provide more than half a person's total support during the calendar year. It does not matter if the money you provide towards support comes from your savings or your earnings or even from money that you borrow, so long as the money is spent on support for the year. Well, earlier in the class, I told you a situation where I had a client and I was desperately trying to figure out how to give her a dependent. And I'm going to describe the situation to you. I have a client. She owns a household. And into this household, she brought a friend so their friend could help take care of her and she could help take care of her friend. They're both ailing in health. She herself has pretty good income and her friend had very little income. Actually, all of her income came from Social Security. And she spent all of the income she had from Social Security to pay these medical bills that she had. So 100% of what income she had from Social Security was spent on her support. So we had a situation where my dependent qualified to claim this person under several of the tests, but not the support test. So let's look at these tests. The dependent was not filing a joint return. The dependent was a member of the household for the entire year. The dependent was a citizen or a resident of the United States. The dependent had gross income less than $3,950. But when we got to the support test, we were done. Because under the support test, we were able to show that my client provided a great deal of support. She provided the roof. She provided all the food in the house, paid most of the utilities for the house. But when we added up and went through the worksheet for support, we were not able to establish that she provided more than half of the support. Because what income or financial resources the friend did have, the amount that was spent on support was a sum amount that was greater than the amount that was considered to have been provided by my client. So we're going to get into the support test worksheet in a moment so you can see how that works. So what is included in total support? Well, total support includes tax-exempt income such as certain Social Security benefits and military housing allowances that are actually spent for that person or used for that person's support. Foster care payments you receive from a state or federal agency for the care of an individual are considered to be amounts provided by the state and not by you. If you are in the trade or business of providing foster care, your unreimbursed expenses are not considered to be support provided by you. Support provided by the state, such as food stamps, housing, etc., must be considered when factoring support unless it can be shown that the benefits were not used for that purpose. A person's own funds that are spent on support have to be factored in. A child's wages that are spent on support must be factored in, as well as the fair market value of free rent. 
but do not include in support federal, state, and local income taxes that are paid by a person from their own income, Social Security and Medicare taxes by, paid by a person from their own income, life insurance premiums, funeral expenses, scholarships received by your child if your child is a full-time student, survivors and dependents educational assistance payments used for support of the child who receives them. So determining total support to figure the amount of support provided by a person and to determine whether you paid more than half, the IRS provides a worksheet. I'm about to show it to you. And the purpose of the worksheet is to establish all sources of money and property that might be used for the support of a person. A division of support when support is provided by more than one person and when support is provided by more than one person, including the dependent, it accounts for how much was provided by you. So when we move over to the worksheet here, we start with entering the total funds belonging to the person that you supported. So in the case of my client, the total funds provided by the person she supported were about $10,000 of Social Security benefits. All by themselves, they were completely non-taxable, which is why she passed the gross income test. We're going to ask how much of that was spent on that dependent support, and when we get down to line five, essentially all 10000 was spent on that individual support. Then we look at expenses for the household, lodging, enter the total rent paid, or enter the fair rental value of the home. Well, my client owned her home free and clear, so she uses the fair rental value of the home. And if the rental value of the home is 1500 a month, and she's paying all of the costs for that home, and there's two of them living in it, then she could say, you know, every month I'm providing $750 of support towards the person that I'm supporting. And then we move down to expenses of the person that you supported. And we're going to look at clothing, education, medical travel, all of the expenses towards that person that was supported and add those up. And did the person provide more than half of his or her own support? And ultimately, when we went through that worksheet, it was close. I really was desperate. I wanted to make it work, but it just wasn't happening. In the end, I determined that my client's friend provided 10000 towards her support, but my client only provided 9000 It just wasn't going to work. So I also have a flow chart here for qualifying relative, and we're going to go through that now. Firstly, dependent taxpayer test. Are you the dependent of another person? The answer must be no. And if it is, you move on to the joint return test. Did the person file a joint return for the year? The answer must be no. And if it is, you move on to the U.S. citizen or resident test. Was this person a U.S. citizen, resident, or a resident of Canada or Mexico for any part of the year? The answer must be yes. And if it is, then we have the not a qualifying child test. Is the person the qualifying child of another person, as defined earlier under the rules for qualifying child? The answer must be no. If the answer is yes, you're out. This person cannot be your qualifying relatives because that person is the qualifying child of someone else, maybe even yourself. <laughs> so they will be claimed as a dependent on the qualifying child rules. But if the person is not the qualifying child of you or anyone else, you move on to the member of household or relationship test. Was the person either a member of your household for the entire year or related to you? The answer must be yes, and if it is, you move on to the gross income test. Did the person have gross income of $3,950 or more? The answer must be no, and if it is, you move on to the support test. Did you provide more than half of that person's total support for the year? The answer must be yes, and if it is, you've got a qualifying relative. All right. So we're going to finish up with dependency with another look at something that comes up occasionally, and that's the multiple support agreement. A multiple support agreement allows you to claim a deduction for a person who was supported more than 50% by two or more people, but none of those people can show that they provided more than half the support individually. To qualify to claim a dependent under a multiple support agreement, all of the following tests must be true. Any person who meets all of the other tests to claim an exemption for the child and provided more than 10% of the support is eligible to claim that dependency. However, you must agree who will actually claim the exemption on his or her return. So what we mean by that sentence is, under a multiple support agreement, these are the tests we're looking at. Joint return, member of household, citizen, gross income, support, and not a qualifying child test, of course. So you can show that you pass all of these tests except one, and that's support. You can't show that you paid more than half the cost of support, but you can show that you and other people combined provided more than half the cost of that person's total support. Who gets to claim the dependency exemption? Does anyone get to claim the dependency exemption? The answer is yes under the terms of a multiple support agreement. So under the multiple support agreement, 
The persons who are eligible to claim the dependency under a multiple support agreement are persons who pass all of those tests except the support test. And when it comes to support, they can also show they paid more than 10% of the support. They don't have to show more than half. They only have to show more than 10. But even if they provided more than 10, if they fail any of those other tests, they're out. Also, the persons who do qualify but are not claiming the dependency exemption must agree to relinquish their right to claim the dependency exemption by signing a statement agreeing not to claim an exemption for that year. The person who claims the exemption must keep the signed documents for his or her records, and the person who claims the exemption must also identify each of the others who were eligible to claim the exemption but agreed not to on Form 2120, Multiple Support Declaration, and then attach Form 2120 to his or her return. So if I am supporting my mother with my sister, and it can be shown that mom provided 20% of her support, and my sister and I between us provided 80%, but each of us only provided 40%, then either my sister or I are eligible to claim our mother under a multiple support agreement. Whichever one of us decides to claim the mother, it has to be on agreement of the other sibling. And so if my sister agrees to let me claim my mother, she's going to sign Form 2120 and I will attach it to my return, and that will allow me to claim my mother under this multiple support agreement. Social security numbers for dependents, you must provide an identification number for every dependent you claim an exemption for, and the dependent's identification number will generally be his social security number. But if your dependent does not have a social security number, you must provide an identification number that is either an ITIN or an ATIN. And of course, you apply for an ITIN or an ATIN through the IRS application process on Form W-7. If you do not have an identification number for your dependent, then you apply for that number by completing Form W-7 and submitting it with your paper tax return along with the required proof of identity. And then you would write the word applied in the space provided for the Social Security number for that dependent on the return. And then once the IRS provides that ITIN number for that dependent, then you would use that number for all future years. Now, if a child was born and died during the year, you may not be eligible to get a Social Security number for them. So if the child died, stayed in the hospital for a week or a month and then died, there may not have been time to get a Social Security number application into place. And if you didn't get an application in and a number was not issued before that child died, you cannot get a Social Security number for a person who is dead. And as a result, there is a provision for that. And IRS says, instead of entering a social security number on the tax return, to enter the word died in the place where you normally would enter the social security number, and then attach a copy of the child's birth certificate instead. The child tax credit is a credit that can reduce your tax. For 2014, the credit is $1,000 for each qualifying child. You claim the credit on line 52 of Form 1040 or line 35 of Form 1040. The child tax credit is tied to the dependency exemption. You can never claim the child tax credit without also claiming the dependency exemption. So in the case of divorced or separated parents, if you give away the child dependency, you're automatically giving away the child tax credit with it. Let's look at what the rules are for qualifying child because the rules for qualifying child are firstly that you must be able to claim a dependency exemption for that child, but there's other additional rules that apply as well. And they include that the child is related to you as a son, daughter, stepchild, foster child, brother, sister, stepbrother, stepsister, or descendant of any of them, and is under age 17 at the end of the year, did not provide more than one half of his or her own support, lived with you for more than half of 2014, is claimed as a dependent on your tax return, and was a U.S. citizen, U.S. national, or a U.S. resident alien. So in other words, the child tax credit cannot be claimed for a child that lives permanently outside of the United States and is not a U.S. citizen or a U.S. national or a green card holder. Frequently, people are applying for ITIN numbers to claim relatives living in Canada or Mexico, and they can use those ITINs to claim dependency exemption for those relatives, but they cannot use them to qualify for the child tax credit. If you are claiming the child tax credit on your tax return, and the person for whom that credit is being claimed does not have a social security number and has an ITIN number, IRS requires you file Form 8812 and attach it to the tax return. Form 8812 goes through a list of questions about that ITIN holder and where that ITIN holder is living. And if you cannot establish that the ITIN holder lived in the United States, then you can't claim child tax credit for that ITIN holder. All right. We're done. That concludes today's class on filing status and dependence. For those of you who are motivated, 
as webinar students, you can go ahead and take the classwork and homework assignments, but if you've had enough, all you need to do is take the password test. But if you are a self-paced student taking this as an online course, not a live class, you are required to go through and complete the classwork and homework assignments to get your CPE. So thank you for participating in today's class. I hope to see you again soon. And if you have any questions, just type them in that chat box. I'll stay past the end of our class today. Just make sure you're all checking out just fine. Any comments, concerns, questions, go ahead and type them. And thanks for participating. Finch, F-I-N-C-H, Finch. We hope you've enjoyed this tax education class. Pacific Northwest Tax School is approved as a CE provider by the IRS and the states of Oregon, New York, and Texas. We have been awarded the Quality Assurance Standard by NASBA and meet the CE requirements for CPAs in most U.S. states and territories. Tax clients demand knowledge and experience. Pacific Northwest Tax School provides the in-depth, practical education needed to improve your understanding of tax law and to meet the demands of the competitive tax preparation industry.